nice and high, and you can raise your hand again. Raise your hand nice and high if you are good where you're at with wherever you are as a vegan or vegetarian, but you want to learn more about the activism side and the outreach and maybe some intersectionality. Okay, cool. All right, so we're going to cover all that too. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Pierce Delahunt. I'm an activist educator. Uh, I've got a Master of Education from the Institute for Humane Education, really wonderful graduate program. Uh, you can find me on any of those uh, social media platforms. I always use the same handle, you can just find me by my name. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I have a Goodreads as well if you want to look at more resources uh, for books, but I'll touch on some of those too. Uh, I think there's a lot of different ways to understand veganism, so I'll uh, go through the way that I think of those, and then uh, we'll carry on from there. So I would say that veganism at best is a political practice to empower others. I would say that at its worst, it is a tool that actually helps to enforce white supremacy and colonialism. At minimum, what veganism is, is a consumer checklist. And that tends to be where a lot of people stay put. Um, but mostly, veganism is anywhere uh, in that spectrum and range of things. Um, and I think that uh, in terms of vegan activism, I'm always trying to, uh, to help to improve the conversation. In terms of vegan activism, I think that uh, we are most guilty of the concept of purity over practice, uh, where we actually need to flip that and make it practice over purity. Because as uh, much as anyone might claim the, to be a pure vegan, there is no such thing. In the six ways that we, uh, that we oppress animals, which is to say food, clothing, entertainment, research, companion animals, pets, and wildlife, uh, there is no escaping from all of six of those systems and living a completely vegan life. Um, we will make mistakes, we will uh, pay for industries that have contamination, we will take a bus ride that has leather seats, we will watch movies that have animals, we will uh, buy crops that depend on uh, animal labor, including almonds. Uh, in the United States, they are 100% bred by bees. Um, we will purchase things that have animal testing because our government requires it. We will purchase things that have palm oil in which uh, contributes to habitat destruction. And we will also purchase things made by actual human slavery, which I would argue goes completely against the concept of veganism. Um, there is no such thing as a pure vegan. The point is that we are in praxis. We work with the system we have to engage with it, to make it better, and to reach out to others and to organize. Um, and that is uh, what I would argue is veganism at its best. Um, the focus must always be on dismantling oppression rather than alleviating our own guilt at participating in a system that we cannot help but participate in, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to go through a lot. Uh, we can, that's a small group, so maybe I can take some questions as we're going in if anyone wants to clarify. Uh, think in general, like if you have any questions you can take toward the end, that's uh, great too. Um, okay, so I'm an activist. The way that I frame that my most, I spend most of my activism in outreach and education. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do activism, but as an outreach and education activist, the way that that plays out is uh, I compare myself to, if you've ever had this experience, you really love a book or a movie and you want to get other people to see it and they either don't care or they see it and they think it's dumb and terrible and they hate you for recommending it to them and making them waste their time. That is my life as an activist. That's what I do constantly. And so uh, part of that practice is building up the stamina and part of that practice is being able to practice my communication with others and, um, and relating to them in a way that makes sense to them and that, uh, that necessarily in and of itself means uh, understanding intersectionality, though I would never uh, devalue intersectionality to just that. Um, and one thing, my own uh, entry point into activism was social emotional learning. That's, I got radicalized from there. Um, and social emotional learning, I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm huge into nonviolent communication. That's the foundation I use for my social emotional learning. But social emotional learning itself, as usual in everything in this world, has a big problem. Traditional what I call individualist mainstream social emotional learning focuses a lot on 
individual relationships like this one person and another person and they'd say if you've got an abusive relationship then how are you going to handle that right that's the idea of individualist mainstream traditional social emotional learning and i think most of the time we all can understand that looking at something like this we would say this is an abusive relationship it's not always the case sometimes it's confusing and sometimes uh, we don't understand what's happening but individual relationships tend to be easier for us to understand i think when you have groups it gets a lot harder but most mainstream social emotional learning doesn't actually address that which i think is a serious problem for this reason if you are in your community and you have never had a fight with anyone you and all your friends always get along and are always happy but and that's that's your whole life all of you every single one everyone you ever meet uh you all live fulfilling lives and fulfilling relationships but it comes you're able to do that because of another community at the expense of them they can't live those fulfilling lives and those fulfilling relationships this is not good social emotional learning by its own logic whereas it doesn't matter that everyone else is happy here and having a good relationship what matters is that it comes at the expense of this and typically the way we work in society now we get another group to do the dirty work for us because we don't want to right so these are the enforcers so there's a lot of different systems that this can be right so uh we can talk about wealthy folk poor folk and uh collaborating middle class we can talk about uh white folk folk of color uh and law enforcement we can talk about uh males females and uh sexual assault assailants depending on which system we're talking about there's a lot of overlap right you can think of these as a Venn diagram um and then we can talk about the United States the countries that we colonize and or extract resources from and the military uh and and government and we can also talk about humans and non-human animals and uh first and foremost the uh animal agriculture system as well as the other five systems that we talked about yeah um so this is uh the basic setup of most uh systems of oppression the way i understand the way i think of it um and uh the questions then become what allows this to happen and how can we intervene um so there are the four d's of disconnection put that right here the four d's of disconnection which also comes in part from non-violent communication are deserve deny diagnose and demand deserve deny diagnose and demand so on an individual level this disconnection comes from thinking uh that person deserves it or denying that that situation is happening or denying our responsibility for that situation diagnosing saying oh well i know what your problem is it's such and such and demand saying uh i uh need you to do this or else i'm going to in the non-violent communication language punish you or shame you or whatever the case may be so in a group setting that can look a lot of different ways depending on the system we're talking about and the ways that that rhetoric plays out in speciesism uh we're talking primarily about uh what melanie joy has written about which is normal natural necessary and someone added this later after melanie joy who does work on carnism as which is the opposite of veganism normal natural necessary and nice these are the four ways that we excuse uh veganism particularly this applies or uh eating animals in particular this applies to other things as well uh historically lots of things have been excused by calling it these things um 
nice meaning. Uh, I know it's not normal, natural, or necessary, but I just like to eat animals anyway um, because it tastes nice. Um, and so, uh, in the course of these, personally, I think necessary is one of the bigger ones to attack because it does. If something is not normal and not natural and not nice, but it's necessary, then there's not a lot of getting around it anyway. So I think uh, that's one thing that we tend to need to focus on. Um, and we can, we can talk about that a little more, but I also want to get through some other stuff. And so um, if anyone has any questions about that? Excellent. Um, so what do we do? Uh, in that case, figuring out how to stop this machine um, there's the four D's of intervention, and that those are delegate, delayed, uh, distract, and direct. And I'll put in parentheses compassion. What do you need? So in this case, in an individual intervention situation, delegate just means getting someone else to deal with it, right? In a school setting, if you're seeing a fight, maybe you don't feel comfortable stepping in, maybe you get your friend, a teacher, or some person of authority. Um, delay means you don't feel comfortable stepping in or can't for whatever reason, but afterward you go up to maybe the person who was being abused and you say, hey, I didn't feel comfortable stepping in, but I saw that and I want you to know it's not cool. Do you need anything? Or the person who was doing the abusing and saying, hey, I didn't feel comfortable stepping in, but I want you to know I saw that and that's not cool, and I hope that you, uh, you know, reflect on that or whatever the case may be. And sometimes that can also be a better way to engage with an abuser if, uh, you know, in the moment they can be dangerous or whatever. Um, and so then there's distract, which is more of a political situation um, in the sense that, uh, like if someone was being abused on the street, um, the street harass, for instance, I could go up to them and I could ask them for directions. Um, and so that way it gives the person who uh, is being harassed some time to break away or whatever and now I'm taking energy away. Um, and then there's direct, just walking in and saying, uh, this is not cool, like this needs to stop right now. Um, and then in parentheses I put compassionate because we can also understand that the abuser is going through pain, right? I, happy people don't scream at each other, right? So seeing that saying, hey, what's going on? And they try to play it off. And then um, and saying, no, I'm good. So, no, I've seen good people before. They're not screaming at other people. So like, what's, what's your deal? Well, how can I help you? You got some needs or something. Um, Nonviolent communication is all about feelings and needs. So if you hear me reference that and you're not sure what context I mean, that's the context. Um, so then the question becomes, how, does the, how do these apply in a group situation? So, uh, normally I like to do uh, questions uh, at, at this point in the sense of asking y'all what ideas y'all have. Um, so, I'll put it out there. Can you think of any ways that this could apply in a setting like intersectional veganism in terms of dismantling oppression? How would we intervene this in a way where we're delegating the job, for instance, the intervention? If you have thoughts about delayed, distract, or direct, too. Yes? Um, for delegate, maybe like uh, companies or, or groups like the Humane Society, or the Humane League, I'm sorry, that um, kind of do the work for us in, in the sense of like talking to the bigger companies to fix their... Totally. Yes, absolutely. If we're uh, thinking about, especially any one of these can be thought about in a, in a monetary sense too. So anytime you donate, for instance, to a nonprofit that is working on that, you are delegating that job. You are saying, I don't have the time or wherewithal or whatever the case may be, but I, I support the work you do and I'm, I'm hiring, paying you to do. Um, so that's what a donation is. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? used to working with the younger crowd, they're usually not as jaded. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go through it. All right, so delayed. My personal favorite example of delayed in terms of activism as a whole is reparations, right? We, we can't stop 
the fact that uh, this country profited off of slavery and the theft of land from uh, nations of other people, right? We often reduce them to think of them as one group of people, but nations of people. Um, but we can compensate for that injustice, so delay. So compensating for, uh, for speciesism, uh, obviously we're not going to hand every animal a check, but we can compensate uh, by giving them their own habitat and leaving them be. Uh, sanctuary is, uh, animal sanctuaries are kind of like a delayed uh, uh, intervention in that way. Um, though they do other things too. Distract. Distract is going to be a little more uh, political in, in the game uh, sense, in that, uh, by that I mean that working with uh, government or uh, corporate uh, uh, abusers, uh, it's going to be playing off of uh, deadlines is the way I think of it. Anything that requires a deadline, you have to take their energy away so that they don't meet that deadline. Uh, if they're trying to get some law passed, um, and there are, make no mistake, they're always passing laws that uh, further criminalize activists. Um, uh, animal activists and eco-activists are often lumped in with uh, anti-terrorism acts, um, those kinds of things. Uh, that's a little trickier one in the, uh, in the group system setting. But then direct is nonviolent direct action, uh, is walking in and making sure that this abuse doesn't happen. So um, in the case of uh, veganism, that could be uh, a, a blockade of some kind that could be stopping the actual abuse from happening, whether that's a, a slaughterhouse situation or, or what have you. Um, any questions about that? Okay, one thing I'll emphasize here is, especially in this setting, with the compassionate component of the direct intervention, I see you, Mike. Um, there's uh, understanding that these people, right, the people who are doing the, uh, the killing of animals and those kinds of things, do, do we have an idea about who these people are in demographics? Anyone want to lay that out there? Okay, who wants to work in a slaughterhouse uh, cutting the throats of uh, hundreds of chickens an hour? Nobody. Exactly. So who do we think has to? People who are paying to. Yeah, people but the have a people, yeah, exactly. People who are among the most disenfranchised and most vulnerable populations of humans that there are in this country um, and worldwide. So when we're doing an intervention in this sense, um, one thing that I think we vegans need to uh, emphasize better in our group is that these people are not the enemy in none of these settings. Right, even in the uh, when we're talking about white supremacy and these are law enforcement, when we're talking about colonialism, this is the army. Um, those those people are either there uh, because uh, of uh, necessity by virtue of needing money to survive, or they're there because they've been sold uh, an indoctrination, just like every one of us else has. We all have some kind of indoctrination that we need to uh, uproot from ourselves. Um, there's no getting out of that. We've all internalized whiteness, we've all internalized uh, uh, human supremacy and, and the rest of it. Um, so understanding that. You had a question. Uh, I was going to ask if uh, being a vegan in and of itself could be an example of direct. Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, there, the, a lot of this is overlap too. So I would say, um, yeah, I would describe veganism as a direct uh, intervention especially insofar as uh, we think of it as like a mass boycott. Um, boycotting is one of uh, the more effective uh, strategies we have. Um, there, I, the way I, I'll add this, the way I think of veganism as that political ideology and practice, right? So there is a way that being vegan will stop this specific species, this intervention, but then if I am uh, a, a uh, how would I phrase this, a, a classist lifestyle vegan, and I purchase all the vegan goods that um, are high-end and uh, still contributing to economic inequality and environmental destruction, then, um, then I'm not actually living out that practice. I'm doing the veganism as a checklist thing. And in that way, it, uh, it contributes to these other problems. And so that I would, I would definitely <coughs> emphasize in the vegan group, because we don't have those conversations often enough. 
Um, and that is why intersectionality is so important. Um, that is going to bring me to... Okay, great. So then now we'll do uh, the social movement analysis stuff. Let me get the... So um, the next few things that I'm going to be referencing are uh, in relation to Bill Moyer, who is an activist, not Bill Moyer's the... Um, oh, there it is. Not Bill Moyer's the uh, journalist. So Bill Moyer, the activist, came out with something called the Movement Action Plan. Um, I would normally recommend reading the book or something, but the truth is I read the book and it's not super well written, so instead I wrote a summary of it and I'm going to recommend that to y'all. Um, so this is the summary I wrote of it, um, but I will give y'all the cliff notes right now. Um, so this is nonviolent action and how it works. Uh, you have your leading opponents, your leading activists, and a spectrum of people between. You have the decision makers, and you're all trying to get the decision makers to make the decisions you want. So the task for activists depends on where they are in this. Um, here, with the people who are all working together already, you want to increase cohesion and activity within your camp. You want a strategy, you want to organize, you want to know, be all on the same page. Then you have friendly neutrals, oblivious neutrals, and hostile neutrals. And here you want to win over or at least neutralize uncommitted third parties. So these people, uh, maybe you can't get them over here, but you can get them to uh, not care enough to work with these people, right? So it's all about outreaching in that particular way. So that's kind of just a broad view, um, but Bill Moyer came out with a couple archetypes and models that he pushes. So this is the four archetypes of being an activist. And he talks about the citizen, the reformer, the rebel, and the change agent. And you can see the middle here are the examples of doing that well and effectively, and then the outside is uh, doing that poorly. Um, and you can be uh, good or bad or in any of those roles. Um, one of the things I like to emphasize with this is that you may think of being an activist as one particular thing, but there are many different ways to be an activist. Um, so the uh, way I like to think of them in terms of um, examples is that I would call the citizen, oh, I would call the citizen, uh, I think the best example we have of that is MLK. Uh, the reformer, uh, I would describe as Nelson Mandela, rebel, Malcolm X, or to use a modern example, Linda Sarsour. And uh, change agent, I think of the founders of Black Lives Matter, uh, Patrice Kalors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. I would also think of uh, Dolores Huerta or uh, Gandhi as uh, examples of change agent. Um, but the one thing that, um, that Bill Moyer emphasizes in this is the ineffective version of a rebel. And the reason that he, like, he emphasizes that so much is because a lot of people think of the rebel as the one way to be an activist, and then they go into it and they start doing that ineffectively. Um, the one sentence summary of how to tell whether you're being an effective rebel or an ineffective rebel is if, uh, if you're familiar with the phrase agent provocateur, that's someone who infiltrates uh, an activist movement paid for by some opposing corporation. So if the work you're doing is indistinguishable from the work that an agent saboteur would be paid for, then you're doing the opponent's work for free, if you think about it that way. So you can be an effective rebel or an ineffective rebel, um, just like you can be effective. The danger of being an ineffective uh, reformer, on the other hand, because these two often clash a lot, is um, working so much within the system that you just give away all your power and you end up compromising completely with the, the powers that be, the decision makers. Um, the, those are the two uh, big examples. Um, and then each, the reason that uh, Bill Moyer separates uh, the activists into those archetypes is because in each one of these stages, uh, those different roles are gonna be emphasized differently. So he breaks it into eight stages, which I think is a little much. I'm working on a smaller summary, but basically stages one through three is the job of the reformers to document everything and prove that those institutional channels of change are not actually functioning as they should. And then stage four 
there's a trigger event. And a trigger event means that national protests break out. Um, and so in the case of that, uh, that's when the rebels come into play. And to be clear, trigger events have been happening all through stages one through three. Uh, by the way, the stages are defined based on how much people oppose power holder policies. So at stage four, you have approximately 40% of the public opposes the official policies, whatever they are. Um, and then there's uh, awareness and uh, public support for the alternatives, which those can change. Uh, they don't have to be all the same line. Um, but so because uh, the trigger events have been happening all the time, right? Because that's just normal times. It's not until you get 40% of the public to oppose what is happening that you can finally take off into stage and pass the uh, into the other stages based on having national protests and making that a, a piece of the media conversation. And so it's through the work of documenting everything and doing the outreach and showing people, no, look, this isn't working, that once that trigger event happens, the movement itself is ready. Um, and then it uh, carries out into uh, uh, stage five, which Bill Moyer emphasizes as an underknown stage where after the, the trigger event and after all those protests, at some point there's a regression to the mean, a lull, and activists think that they've failed. And he calls it uh, stage five activist failure. Um, but it's just a perceived failure because of course there's gonna be a regression to the mean. There's always a regression to the mean. Um, and so uh, it's understanding that that is just part of the natural progression and not to actually think of ourselves as having failed. Um, and then over the course of that, uh, the power shifts back to the change agents and uh, reformers who make those institutional changes. Um, and once you get, and so like if we're using this, right, as veganism as a whole, then we're still over here somewhere. If we're using opposition to factory farms, I don't know exactly what the, the percentages are, but it's gonna be much farther than veganism as a whole. If we're uh, looking at the banning of gestation crates, um, that's going to be farther along as well. So in planning out strategy, uh, all of those different campaign goals are, are along uh, somewhere else, uh, different in the public opposition and on these trajectories. And so when we're strategizing, we want to think, where are each of those campaign goals? What is weak? What is strong? How can we push each one forward? How can we maintain the achievements that we've gotten and continue to push these other things? Yeah. Uh, to clarify, what is a gestation crate? Oh, great question. So the gestation crate, uh, referring to just the uh, process of gestation when uh, a female is pregnant with her young, um, gestation crates are popular in the pig industry where pigs, uh, pig mothers uh, will uh, be forced to lie down in cages where they can't move or anything. Um, and uh, it's, it's a place where they keep pregnant pigs. Um, and that's the idea. Is that awesome? Well, we're going to be talking more about the, the processes uh, and, and mechanics, or the oppressive mechanisms of uh, speciesism as well. Um, so I want to emphasize that this is not fair, right? This isn't right. This isn't good that we need to uh, organize and follow these kinds of things in order to fight against uh, oppressive systems of any kind, uh, animals or uh, police brutality or what have you, or colonialism, but this is how the system works, right? The reason that we have uh, the extent of colonialism that we have today, among many other reasons, is because most people just aren't even aware of the problem, right? Um, or they, they think they're aware, but then they have those same justification narratives of normal, necessary, uh, natural and nice, or the other uh, disconnection of these. Um, but so, uh, one of the reasons that I emphasize intersectionality with all of this is because in our outreach, we can think of activism um, in the same way that we think of marketing, which I don't n normally necessarily like to take my cues from uh, the economic machine, but um, they, the stuff that they do, they do really well. So marketing can be thought of on three levels. There is marketing the product, 
marketing the experience and the third level is marketing the identity and what marketers have discovered is that all marketing works on the level of identity even when you're advertising a product people don't actually look so much at the product necessarily as they do the identity so if a person comes to you and says here is uh, product XYZ and here are the best uh, features about this product or whatever what the person who is listening to you is noticing is the kind of person who is pitching this and they if they can think well this person's really cool or they can think no I want nothing to do with this person and so that is something that I think activists in general need to better understand and especially vegans because we've got a lot of issues in the vegan movement including the purity over uh, practice issue I've mentioned before um, but uh, in addition to that, we also have a serious white supremacy problem in the vegan community. Um, so if you had any doubt that uh, veganism, what I said before, veganism could be used as a tool to enforce white supremacy and colonialism, uh, then look no further than the fact that there are right-wing, even Nazi vegans. Um, and that's not to say that Hitler himself was vegetarian, I'm pretty sure that's a myth, I haven't uh, checked into that recently. But, um, uh, but they, are, they exist, Nazi vegans, right-wing vegans. And when, uh, for example, a person of color is approached by a right-wing vegan telling them, or even just a, a well-intentioned, uh, well-meaning white person vegan, and telling them about uh, all the benefits of going vegan, and then the person of color realizes that uh, this either Nazi or well-intentioned white person doesn't know anything about race, then that person understands, oh, veganism is part of the identity of either Nazism or well-meaning white people or whatever the case. And so as a, a particularly privileged, wealthy white male, uh, hetero, cis, uh, et cetera, et cetera, person, I am very careful to understand all the intersections of, of all of this. So that I, firstly and foremost, uh, just as a white person, I want to understand racism, uh, first and foremost. But secondly, as uh, a person in this case doing vegan outreach, I want to understand how people of color move through racism in their attempt to go vegan. Um, because that does uh, bring up different challenges that I am not familiar with. Um, for example, uh, if we're looking at uh, those people in working in the slaughterhouses, a number uh, of them, the, I believe a plurality, if not majority of them, are undocumented immigrants. And so uh, if I'm going to be telling them uh, why they need to quit their job, then I've got to understand how hard that is for them, at the very least. Uh, but ultimately, I wouldn't even be telling them that. Um, that uh, I would, is a fight I would take to the corporation. Um, are there any questions about any of that? Excellent. Um, so all those things that we just talked about, um, we can get more specific now with the vegan stuff. I'll leave you before we do that specifically, I'll say there are three what I call always things you can do. The three always things are research, support, and engage. And so if you're not sure what to do in any given moment, you can always read more. You can always Google something. You can always figure out a question that was burning uh, that you've had or uh, read about something you're already familiar with. but a new take on it or whatever the case. You can always look for uh, the uh, research and scholarship uh, from marginalized groups about whatever your issue is. So in this case, we could look at uh, uh, vegan women of color and what they have to say about it. You can always uh, center those voices. Um, so that's research. You can always support. If you're not sure what activism you can do, you can always support others who are activists even in their self-care because self-care is activism too. So you can make them a nice meal. Maybe they've had a stressed week. If you are helping to take care of their needs, then they can better take care of the needs of others in their activism. And then the other thing, uh, the third always thing is engage. So you can always be talking to people who disagree with you, and that includes listening, because the better that we listen to people who disagree with us, then the more likely they are to listen to the next person in the next conversation that they have with, uh, with that activist cause. Uh, remember, if they think of us as good listeners, right? Then the next time they engage with a vegan activist, they'll say, oh, this is someone I can talk to, and we can have a conversation about that. 
Um, so those are, those are the three always things. Um, and then, as far as the me mechanics of uh, factory farming and all that. This is, by the way, my vegan guide. It's a vegan resource guide. You can take a look at it on my Medium account. Um, I go through a lot of this stuff, including uh, sources. Um, I'll say some of my favorite sources are Afroism, which is written by two black vegan sisters in essays back and forth to each other um, by Af and Sil Co are their names. Uh, really awesome book about the intersectionality between white supremacy and human supremacy. Um, Beasts of Burden is another favorite. Uh, this is written by a uh, disabled vegan woman, and she writes about uh, the intersectionality between ableism and speciesism. Her name is Sonara Taylor. Um, really awesome stuff in there uh, as well. So those are two of my favorites, but there's a whole list of books and, uh, and documentaries and, uh, and some of my own uh, real quick thoughts on that. Um, and then this slide, this I call, Where is Your Line? Because, let's see if I can move this. Everyone see that a little better? So where is your line? Because the idea being, if there was any one industry that, uh, that we could look at, uh, and right now we're going to do uh, factory farming and animal agriculture, um, that was, uh, and we wanted to ask the question, is this industry crossing my line to the point that I will no longer engage with it and fund it and support it? Um, maybe if the industry got up a little sick every now and then, and it had a high turnover rate, and it hurt plant life a little bit, and some animals had to die. Um, maybe, depending on what industry that was and, and the benefits that it offered to humanity and the planet, that might be a little worth it, depending on whatever the situation is. Um, but if uh, this industry contributed to epidemics such as the Spanish flu that wiped out a greater percentage of the human population than any other flu ever has. It's the Spanish flu of 1918. Um, and the turnover rate is 100%, over 100%, because more people chain, leave the job than, uh, than, uh, than they come in over the space of a year, um, as well as a high injury rate. Maybe that starting to raise a couple flags. Um, and maybe if it is uh, the number one contributor to uh, biodiversity loss on a couple different uh, levels, or at least in the top five, and maybe if 9.6 billion land animals are killed every year, and trillions of fish every year, that's more fish are killed than the number of humans that have ever existed, maybe that starts to cross our line a little bit. Um, maybe if uh, animal agriculture or whatever the case may be contributes to the top 15 causes of death in the United States and every single one of those 15 causes of death can be prevented, treated, or even reversed by adopting a vegan diet, um, then, then maybe it's a little more uh, worth it to pull out of this system and maybe this system crosses our line that much more. Um, maybe if this system, if you think, how many people here uh, think that the pharmaceutical industry is a corrupt industry? Yeah. I agree, I like to see that. If you think that, then you best believe that animal agriculture is corrupt as well. The animal agriculture industry, the whole industry is one of the biggest clients of pharmaceuticals because they rely on antibiotics in order to make their whole system go. And um, if you think about it, if you have animals cramped and quarters like that, you're creating a monoculture of uh, animal life. And when you have a monoculture of anything, you're creating breeding grounds for uh, the things that feed on those things. So in the case of animals, we're talking about um, bacterial infection. And so, but in animal agriculture is both the number one contributor to the problem of antibiotic resistant diseases and bacteria, as well as destroying one of 
the best sources for new antibiotics, which is the um, the rainforest. The other is uh, caving, but and you know, water culture doesn't have much to do with that yet. Um, maybe if the industry were rampant with false advertising and uh, corrupted uh, local governments and federal governments and disenfranchised entire communities by rendering them all sick. Um, I was just learning about the asthma rates. Um, but they're bad, whatever the numbers were. Um, I think that was a, a big issue in North Carolina recently, uh, associated in part with the hurricane. Um, and uh, maybe if uh, worker exploitation is rampant in these animal agriculture industries, uh, which is one of the reasons why I would say if you are a vegan, you need to be a leftist. Uh, if you're a leftist, you need to be a vegan. Um, uh, we can, if that were happening at the rate it is in animal agriculture, that would cross our line a little more. Uh, if the field itself was rampant with sexual harassment and sexual assault and racism, and it was the number one contributor to world hunger, those are the United Nations words, not mine. Um, if it contributes so much to climate change that it is the number one contributor, 18% of all fossil fuels are from the animal agriculture industry, that's more than the entire transportation industry combined, um, then we are actively contributing to the plight of climate refugees uh, whenever we participate in the system. Um, not to mention actual human slavery is rampant in the animal agriculture industry too. Also the plant-based agriculture industry as well. Um, so I'm not trying to let vegans off the hook entirely on that one um, or any of these things. But, um, but especially the fishing industry is huge with, um, with slavery, on, especially on an international level. Um, and if we're looking at uh, resource use. Uh, uh, Peter already mentioned uh, water use and water saved. Was that 30,000 gallons? 220,000. Two, that's even more. 220,000 gallons of water saved from one person going vegan. We are entering a water crisis. Uh, that is happening. Um, and uh, yeah, genetic engineering is definitely an issue um, with uh, agriculture as a whole, but also animal-based uh, animal agriculture. They are trying to genetically engineer animals. Uh, salmon is a big one right now. Um, and then pollution, the number one sources, uh, or uh, one of the top contributors of uh, pollution, both plastic feces and uh, carbon dioxide, is from animal agriculture. Um, plastic being used to wrap and preserve a lot of the products. Feces, when you, again, monoculture of uh, animals, whether that's chicken, pigs, or cows, or whatever the case may be, there's a lot of uh, fecal waste that just has to be dealt with, and uh, they're dealing with it is just dumping it into a pit. They call it a lagoon. Um, people regularly die from uh, being close enough to it that they pass out and drown inside a fecal lagoon, um, not to mention the uh, environmental impact of the leaching from that. Um, and remember, they're being fed uh, tons of antibiotics without even being sick, um, uh, except from the, uh, the close confinement. Um, and then carbon dioxide being the number one contributor uh, in the culture. Um, fish species by 2050, a uh, number of them are going to go extinct. Um, of all corporations to, to pop up in this way, the uh, corporation, the company Mitsubishi, actually sitting on millions of dollars worth of I think it's a particular species of tuna right now and they are depending on that species of animal going extinct and the disruption of disruption of, uh, of the whole ecological web because of that because if that species of tuna goes extinct then they can profit in the millions of dollars if that species comes back Mitsubishi loses millions of dollars um, so there are absolutely very intentional uh, very thought through uh, strategies of uh, exploiting and extracting wealth as much as possible in all these horrible ways. Um, if you are a vegetarian and you weren't sure about uh, dairy and eggs, the dairy industry is part of the veal industry. Um, the whole concept of dairy is that we have a mother uh, giving her milk to her young. Um, if we're drinking that milk, then something's got to happen with the young and they're sold off to the veal industry. Um, eggs, uh, when you have uh, there are two different types of 
chickens in the animal agriculture industry. There are egg layers and there are meat, they call them broilers. Um, and uh, if you're an egg layer chicken and you're not used for meat, and you're a male chicken, so you don't even lay eggs, then the animal agriculture industry has no use for you. And as a baby male chick, uh, you are thrown into a grinder or tied into a plastic bag and thrown into a, a garbage can. And you are left to either be crushed or suffocate to death. Um, and it's not entirely uh, easy to distinguish the sex of a, of a chick, so they're just guessing, and half of them, whatever the rate is, uh, they might be wrong about. They might end up keeping a whole bunch of male chicks that they have to kill later. Um, habitat destruction. Uh, animal agriculture is one of the biggest uh, in contributors to habitat destruction on every level. Um, we're talking the uh, deforestation um, to uh, to create a room for a ranch, um, in, uh, especially in Brazil. Um, or we're talking uh, uh, the uh, pollution from the fecal waste uh, in terms of just the habitat destruction in that area. Um, and uh, companion animal food. If you were wondering uh, where does my uh, pet food come from, uh, a good amount of that comes from uh, meat not fit for human consumption. And that's animals that they uh, throw away um, who are killed in the, um, in the farms but uh, for whatever reason can't sell to humans. Um, that's if they uh, don't sell it to humans anyway. Um, and then, if you were thinking about organic grass-fed and pasture-raised, so uh, a lot of people don't actually know this, grass-fed and pasture-raised are actually the highest standards. Um, grass-fed is for uh, cows and pasture-raised is for chickens and pigs. Um, and if you want to say that that's better, sure, I'm, I'll agree that that is better than factory farming. And I uh, also do uh, believe in the value of reducing our participation on any level. Um, so I won't, I won't knock that, um, but these industries are still uh, uh, just as, um, or perhaps a little less exploitive um, of animals and, and everyone else in the system um, that it is, it is killing. Um, so that is the overview of uh, the animal agriculture and where is your line. And I'll say anything you care about can absolutely be tied to animal agriculture. Um, and sometimes when I say that, people think that I'm saying animal agriculture is the most important uh, issue. I would never discredit another movement. Just the way like anything you care about can also be tied to white supremacy. Um, so that is also uh, just as important. Um, but uh, in a vegan lecture, yes, anything that uh, you care about can be tied to the abuses of the animal agriculture industry. And so one of the things that I do in my travels, uh, in my eco-equipped van that Peter referenced, is um, I will sit outside of uh, different places in the context of animal agriculture. Uh, I will sit outside of, the first time I ever did this was with a McDonald's. And I sat there with a sign that says, ask me why I no longer eat here. And so a couple ways, a couple reasons I like that is it circumvented a couple things that we as activists have going against us. Um, it's hard to walk up to a person who is struggling to make ends meet, right? Uh, who we're watching the shrinking of the middle class in the United States right now. It's less than half of the population right now is the middle class. Um, so for me to go up to a person, tell them who's struggling, who's rushed on time, who's like stressed with raising a family, whatever the case may be, and I tell them, listen, I know that you think you have a lot on your plate, but actually everything that you're doing is wrong, is actually evil, like good luck trying to have that conversation, right? So what I did was I set up in front of McDonald's, I asked for people to come to me. If they were in a space where they were ready to hear that conversation, they could come up to me and I said, ask me why I no longer eat here. Um, no longer eat here, meaning yes, I used to in fact eat at McDonald's. I uh, tried to collect all the Happy Meal toys, so I was really into it. Um, and then over time I learned how, how awful it was. Um, and then when they come up to me, I uh, have a spinner. All it says is, environment, animal, human, and personal public health. And I ask them if they have any one of the, these things they want to talk about, or if they don't, they can spin. So it makes it a little active uh, and engaging. Um, as well as gives them an opportunity, maybe, right, they know about the environmental consequences, um, but they haven't heard about the personal public health or the human rights. Most of the time people choose the human rights component because I think that's one of the things that uh, the, the fewest people are familiar with. Um, and so when a McDonald's worker came up to me, I, the first thing I brought up was, um, and she, she participated, she asked me, 
Um, the first thing I brought up was that McDonald's had not signed on to the $15 minimum wage campaign, and she appreciated that. Um, but um, and so that if if I were outside McDonald's, I would use McDonald's specific information. But this is an overview of the whole industry. Um, so in that way, I believe that we can create a new narrative of the identity of what it means to be an activist, which is that we can actually be the most helpful uh, and most informative sources of information when people say, oh, I've seen that person before, I've been wanting to talk to them, like now I have the time and I can engage them in this conversation. And we can be that source for people to help um, give them life rather than be uh, shaming them, um, which I, I will say that I think activists have a worse rap than we actually do that, but that is the nature of this, is that any time I have this conversation, I'm working against that image because the people will naturally get defensive. So the fact that we actually do participate in that makes it even worse. Um, are there any questions about anything that we've covered at all? In pushing this line further along and the whole movement uh, further along, I would look for the other things uh, that are farther along, like the banning of gestation crates or um, better uh, health um, law enforcement. Anything you can do to throw a wrench into the system to reduce profits. That's one thing that I think that the, um, the left suffers from is that we are not honest about with the, the, the activist organizers are not honest about what it is we're doing. We say we'll throw down a regulation and we'll say, um, I don't know why they're like so uh, fighting this one regulation so hard. Like all we want to do is make sure like this one protection or whatever. Um, but uh, the way I see it, uh, they, they know. They know that every regulation put forth is an attempt to uh, uh, suffocate their industry. Um, and that's why they fight it so much. And we need to be more honest about that so that we come and fully show up. Um, and that's where you get a lot of split in the vegan community between uh, uh, what they call the abolitionist approach and welfareist approach, which um, I'm sure Humane League has dealt with in their uh, uh, conversations before. But I personally am, yes, an abolitionist vegan, but I disagree uh, with uh, a lot of the rhetoric I have seen from the abolitionist approach where it's just useless to put forth or push for any welfareist measure. Um, that I, I disagree with completely because uh, every welfareist uh, regulation or addition that we can give makes it that much less profitable to uh, exploit animals. And I think that that is, is what we're going for, is reducing that profitability so, because not a direct action, a lot of people uh, uh, don't necessarily um, understand the way nonviolent direct action works. Nonviolent direct action is not about getting someone to sympathize with you. It's not about winning over their someone's heart. It's about making their own self-interest aligned with the collective interest. So, it doesn't matter whether you would. I mean, to it in a, in this conversation, I, I would say this matters in, in another conversation. It doesn't matter whether you would uh, raise and kill animals for profit. What matters is whether you do in this nonviolent direct action conversation. And if it's no longer profitable to do that, you won't. Um, and so that is what nonviolent direct direct action is about. So in that way, direct action of setting up a blockade it can be seen as a tax on the industry. If you're going to do this then you've got to account for the cost of dealing with us every month or year or whatever it is. And that means that they are less likely to want to do that. So in uh, pushing forth the gestation crates and all that, then more and more people can get on board because you are also using uh, those platforms as a conversation for the greater conversation. So if, uh, if someone, some state banned gestation crates, then media people are going to be interviewing activists about that. And then we say, yeah, well, this is great, but let's also remember uh, the whole conversation of animal agriculture is actually destroying the planet and use that as the platform. Um, and that's the, the effective way to go about it. The ineffective way that we were talking before is uh, focusing the conversation and wasting away that opportunity so that people think, oh, the gestation crates are banned. Well, that means I can eat pigs now because like, at least they don't have to go through that, right? Um, and letting that 
and frame and narrative take over. But that, that doesn't have to happen. That's just uh, something that uh, we need to counter. <coughs>